Ace ones. Secret of holding your Bluetooth earbuds in your hand when I sleep? That is a good skill. I ought to use music to get myself to sleep these days. I might need it. This story is called The Wolf Arrow. It's a Dutch folktale. The soldier had fought his last battle for the king's army. He was returning home to his father's farm, where he hoped to settle to a more peaceful life. He's an archer, skilled and strong. He still carried his bow, but the quiver on his back only held one arrow. A souvenir of the life he was leaving behind. It was fletched with his favorite feathers. Silvery gray feathers. That made the arrow fly true. He was nearing his home, walking softly along the country lane. When he heard some not the loud chanting of an army singing to terrify the enemy, or to cover up the fear in their own hearts, but a cheerful melody and a light, high voice singing a counting song about flowers. He looked over the wall into the nearest field and saw a little girl sitting in the middle of the meadow. Her head bent over a daisy chain as she sang her song. The archer smiled. The world which contained daisies and singing children. This was why he was coming home. Then he saw a dark shadow creeping through the grass and flowers. A low, long, hairy shadow creeping toward the girl. A wolf. The wolf leapt. The archer put his last arrow from his quiver, knocked it onto the string of his bow, drew the string back, and released the arrow. He didn't pause to aim, because he knew his arrow would follow his eye. As the arrow left the bow, the wolf was still leaping high in the air, aiming for the girl's neck. The arrow struck the wolf in the shoulder. The wolf fell out of the air, yowling in pain, and rolled over into the grass. The archer jumped over the wall, and the wolf ran off, 
splendid. Then the archer had no more arrows. And the girl was screaming in shock. She picked her up, carried her to the farmhouse at the end of the meadow, and put her in the arms of her mother. Then he continued on his way home. His family was delighted to see him. They prepared a feast to celebrate his return. There haven't been so many lambs recently, said his father, as they prepared the meat for roasting. Because we've been troubled by wolf attacks, there is one beast that takes children if they stray too far from home. The archer mentioned quietly the wolf he'd shot. His father patted his shoulder and said, he had another reason to celebrate. The archer's mother invited all the neighbors, including the little girl's family, to the homecoming feast. Everyone in the district came, all but their next door neighbor, from the farm down the track. Oh, where is our next door neighbor? The archer's mother wondered. He normally has a great appetite for other people's food. Everyone laughed and waited for the neighbor to turn up, but he never arrived. Not when the smell of perfectly roasted meat wafted across the fields. Not when the flames of the bonfire rose high in the sky. Not when the singing got a bit too loud. The archer and his father decided to check if their neighbor was alright. It's not like him to miss a feast, said the archer's father as they crossed the fields. When they reached the neighbor's house, the back door was wide open, so the archer and his father walked in. Their neighbor was lying on the stone floor of the kitchen, stretched out, stiff and cold, with blood pulled under his chest and an arrow in his shoulder. That's my own said the archer. That's the arrow I shot at the wolf. And that's how they discovered their neighbor had feasted on stolen lambs and perhaps even stolen children. The archer kept his one last arrow. Not as a reminder of the wars he'd fought, but as a reminder that he'd shot a werewolf and a warning that he could do it again. For the rest of his long and peaceful life, on his family farm and on the farms around, lambs grew fat all summer, and the children played in safety, and the wolf gray arrow was never needed again. It's actually a really good story. Kind of chilling as well. Classy too, yeah. If you have any requests, uh, throw them at me. I've got my whole library uh, open to me right now.
luxury in a second. Sea monster? Alright. I had a dream this morning, I was on a ship infested with a sting like monsters. At one point I was dragged into the ocean and transformed. I've had dreams sort of like that. I've had dreams where I've been pulled through like a floor that suddenly became liquid. It's very unsettling. someone was the cause, then I was someone else. Oh, someone was cause, then I was someone else. Get confused how I'm breathing in water. It's, uh... I know what you mean, yeah. I definitely know what you mean. Let me see what I can do for you in terms of, um, water, though. We should have this aplenty. Sea monsters, you say? Oh, I could pull out a physical book for this one, actually. Hmm. Let's take a look-see. Are you looking for specifically sea monsters, or would spooky sea stories in general do? It's no trouble, I just want to know your preference. Either or? Alright. How about this? I'll give you both. I'm just prepping myself. One moment. I dream of the sea, I yearn for the sea. I miss, I miss the sea. Um, in the summer. 
In the summer, my mother and I always swim in the ocean. Always have. Um. <laughs> Ever since I was old enough to remember early, I remember going to the beach with my mom and her parents. And the salt in the water and walking along the shore with my grandmother and looking for seashells. Digging holes in the sand. Still look for seashells. My whole windowsill is lined with seashells. I love, I love the ocean. And I feel so clean every time I I go in there, everything is just scoured away. Sand stuff smoothly. And the force of the waves take care of everything else. And the smell of salt water and seaweed. And the sun. And all the gulls. Ring bill blows. Not too many laughing where we go, but I've seen herring gulls for sure. Occasional greater black back, maybe. And little sandpipers. Little birds. Sprint forward as the water recedes and away when the water rushes up. Tiny little birds. Mom used to think they were babies, <laughs> baby seagulls. And the sand crabs. Whenever they dug, get dug up, they rush back under the sand. Grandma used to call them squelchies. I miss it. When my work calms down in July, you best believe you'll find me at the beach in the water. I'm a seashell hunter. Oh yeah, born and raised. Got surf, surf clam shells. I got scallop shells. I got oh god, anything you could find in the North Atlantic, I got it. Got a little like oyster shells for days. Scallops, cockles. God, I have so many shells, I don't even know what they all are. Got a sand dollar from Florida. See if I can get you sea monsters. Hold on, I gotta... I gotta look a little bit. 
clipping that from the VOD later. That was genuine joy hearing you talk. Thank you. I get scared of, of running my mouth too much. Let's see. Legends and superstitions. Hold on. I bet I have something and I'm just not remembering. I have a lot of spooky stories on the sea. I'm looking specifically for sea monsters. I know they're here. I know I know they're there. I accounted for this. be something where I'm not looking for it. Let me just see. Some wouldn't have anything. Let me see if I just see. See if I'm with margin. Ah, there's a whole section. This might be more of a, a lecture in nature, though. I think this more talks about the history of the legend, but I bet I can work something with that. Let's go with... The Nahant Beach Monster. Or not. Ah, here we go. There has always been something a little difficult between myself and Massachusetts. Some incompatibility. Quoted from H.G. Wells. The way the world is going. Nahant is the name of a beach close to Swampscott in Massachusetts. John Marston, fisherman of that town, claimed his place in history by being the first witness of an unusual event. At about 8 o'clock in the morning of August 3rd, 1819, Marston was walking along the Nahant beach and his attention was attracted by a disturbance in the water. About 200 yards offshore, 
Ventu is no doubt considered then to his no doubt considerable amazement mixed very likely with a attrition of alarm the head of an enormous serpent broke the surface of the water and stared at him Marston spent 20 minutes staring back at the apparition until he realized that unless he gathered a few witnesses no one would believe his story in no time at all he had 200 citizens of Swamp Scott down on the beach and gaping at the sea serpent as it roamed the bay in an apparent search of fish for breakfast. The beast suddenly headed for the shore. The gathered crowd turned and ran off in terror, lest the creature be a mind to include them in its early morning feed. Among the watchers were some of the most notable citizens of the town including Honorable Amos Lawrence, Samuel Cabot, presumably a scion of the Clan Cabot of Boston, and James Pintz, a local U.S. Marshal. From these sober folk emerged an agreed description of their aquatic visitor. Dark brown and 80 to 90 feet long. There were some humps, alternately, serrations on its back as it moved through the water faster than a whale. Notwithstanding this last characteristic, some whaling vessels chased the creature, and one of them, for some inscrutable reason, fired a cannon and apparently hit it, whereupon it dived in very sensibly, sensibly swam out to sea. Bridges advisors. Bridges advises the reader that his records include several accounts of sea serpents showing themselves in the cold and deep waters off of Maine. In Massachusetts. In British Columbia. As well, of course, in Norwegian waters. Which last might be regarded as the historical home of sea monsters in general and perhaps hysterical home as well. One of Bridges' records is an account of an actual attack on a vessel by a sea serpent, an event not frequently encountered, apparently. Oh, you know what? I should look in Maine. I have a book for Maine. Should be easy to do. Probably scare staring right the fuck at it, not seeing it. Well, the Texas coast might have something too. Wisconsin is not gonna help me. East Maine. There we go. Hold on, I gotta do a little scrolling. <laughs> Yo, Thunder Kitty. Those are not. That's 
Hold on, I gotta look for actually like Back. Did you know that there are some birds that sing songs all year round? One of the ones that reside in um, the northern, northeastern part of the United States is the Carolina Wren. They sing all year round. They have a beautiful song as well. Hold on. Sea monster stories. Hold on. Sorry, I know I'm taking my sweet time today. I just got on. Gotta enjoy myself at my own pace, that's fair just got on. Uh, yeah. Right. Ah, I know where we're going. You want a sea monster, I'll give you a sea monster. I'll give you the sea monster. find it. Give me a second. 
looking for something very specific. Ah. Give me a sec, I'm sorry. This is Himir and Thor's fishing expedition from the canon of Norse mythology. The gods arrived at Egir's huge hall at the end of the sea. We are here, cried Thor, who was at the head of the company. Make a feast for us. Egir was the greatest of the sea giants. His wife was Ran into whose net those who drown at sea are gathered. His nine daughters are the waves of the sea. <laughs> Please hold your card available. Staff is occupied with other customers. <laughs> your call is important. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to take that long. Egir had no desire to feed the gods, but he also had no wish to fight them. He looked Thor in the eye and said, I will make you a banquet, and it will be the finest feast that any of you have ever attended. My servant, Fimothan, will serve each of you diligently, bringing you as much food as your bellies can hold, and as much ale as you can drink. I have only one condition. I will throw the feast, but you must bring me a cauldron big enough to brew ale for you all. There are so many of you, and your appetites are huge. Egir knew well that the gods had no such cauldron, and without the cauldron, he did not have to give a feast. Thor asked the other gods for advice, but each god he asked was of the opinion that such a cauldron did not exist. Finally, he asked Tyr, god of battle and oaths, god of war. Tyr scratched his chin with his left hand, which was his only hand after he lost the other one to Fenrir. On the edge of the world sea, he said, lives the giant king Himir. He owns a cauldron three miles deep. It is the biggest cauldron there has ever been. Can you be sure? asked Thor. Tyr nodded. Himir is my stepfather. He is married to my mother. He said, she is a giant. I have seen the great cauldron with my own eyes, and as my mother's son. I will be welcome in Himir's hall. Tyr and Thor climbed into Thor's chariot, pulled by the goats Snarler and Grinder, and swiftly they traveled to Himir's enormous fortress. Thor tied the goats to a tree, 
and the two made their way inside. There was a giantess in the kitchen, cutting up onions as big as boulders, and cabbages the size of boats. Thor could not help staring. The old woman had nine hundred heads, each uglier and more terrifying than the last. He took a step backward. If Tyr was disturbed, he did not show it. Tyr called out, Greetings, Grandmother. We are here to see if we can borrow Hymir's cauldron to brew our beer. Ha! Ah, such tiny things! I thought you were mice, said Tyr's grandmother. When she spoke, it sounded like a crowd of people shouting. You do not want to talk to me, grandson. You should talk to your mother. She called out. We have guests. Your son is here with a friend. And in moments, another giantess walked in. This was Himir's wife, Tyr's mother. She was dressed in a golden cloth, and she was as beautiful as her mother-in-law was alarming. She carried two of the tiniest giant thimbles, which she had filled with beer. Thor and Tyr gripped the thimbles, which were the size of buckets, and they drank the beer with enthusiasm. It was excellent beer. The giantess asked Thor his name. Thor was about to tell her. Before he could speak, Tyr said, His name is Vior, mother. He's my friend. And an enemy of the enemies of Kimir and the giants. They heard a distant rumbling, like thunder on the peaks, or mountains crumbling, or huge waves crashing to the shore. And the earth shook with each rumble. Oh, my husband is coming home, said the giantess. I hear his gentle footsteps in the distance. The rumbling became more distinct and seemed to be coming rapidly closer. My husband is often bad tempered when he gets home, wrathful and grim of mind. He treats his guests badly. The giantess warned them. Why don't you get under that kettle and stay there until he's cheerful enough for you to come out? She hid them beneath the kettle on the floor in the kitchen. It was dark under there. And the ground shook. The door slammed. And Thor and Tyr knew that Ymir must be home. They heard the giantess tell her husband that they had guests. Her son and a friend, and that he had to be on his best behavior as a gracious host, and not to kill them. Why? The giant's voice was loud and petulant. The little one is our son, Tyr. You remember him. The big one's name is Vior. Be nice to him. Thor? Thor, enemy? Thor, who's killed more giants than anyone else, even other giants. Thor, who I've sworn to slay, if I ever can counter him. Thor, the Vior, said his wife, calming him down. Not Thor, Vior. He's our son's friend and an enemy of your enemies, so you must be nice to him. I am grim of mind and wrathful of spirit. I have no desire to be nice to anyone, said a huge, rumbling giant's voice. Where are they hiding? Oh, just behind that beam over there, said his wife. Thor and Tyr heard a crash as the beam she pointed to was smashed and broken. It was followed by another series of crashes as one after the other all the kettles in the kitchen were knocked down from the ceiling and destroyed. Are you finished breaking things? asked Tyr's mother. Ah, I suppose so, said Himera's voice grudgingly. 
Then look under that kettle, she said. The one on the floor that you didn't destroy. The kettle beneath, which Tyr and Thor were hidden, was lifted. And they found themselves staring up at an enormous face. Its feast its features twisted in a sulky scowl. This, Thor knew, was Himir, the giant king. His beard was like a forest of ice-covered trees in midwinter. His eyebrows like a field of thistles. His breath as rank and foul as a midden in the ball. Hello, dear said Himir, without enthusiasm. Hello, father, said Tyr, with, if possible, even less pleasure. You'll join us as guests at dinner, said Himir. He clapped his hands. The door of the hall opened, and a giant ox was let in, its coat shining, its eyes bright its horns sharp. It was followed by another even more beautiful. And then the last ox even finer than the first two. These are the most excellent oxen in existence. So much bigger and fatter than the beasts of Midgard or Asgard I am. Himir confided. I am enormously proud of my herd of cattle. They are my treasures, and the delight of my eyes. I treat them like my own children. And for a moment, his scowling face seemed to soften. The grandmother, with the nine hundred heads, killed each ox, skinned it, and tossed it into her enormous cooking pot. The pot boiled and bubbled over a fire, which hissed and spat. And she stirred it with a spoon, as big as an oak tree. She sang quietly to herself as she cooked, in a voice like a thousand old women all singing at the top of their voices at once. And soon enough, the food was ready. Your guests here do not stand on ceremony. Take as much as you can eat from the pot said Himir expansively. The strangers were small after all. How much could they eat? And after all, the ox were enormous. Thor said he didn't mind if he did. He proceeded to devour two of the oxen all by himself, one after another, leaving nothing but clean-picked bones. And then he belched in a satisfied way. That's a lot of food, Vior said Himir. It was meant to feed us for several days. I do not think I've ever seen a giant eat two of my oxen at once before. I was hungry, said Thor, and I got a little carried away. Look, tomorrow, why don't we go out fishing? I hear you are quite a fisherman. Himir prided himself on his skills at fishing. I am an excellent fisherman, he said. We can catch tomorrow night's dinner. I do am a fine fisherman, said Thor. He'd never fished before. But how hard could it be? We'll meet tomorrow at dawn, out on the dock, said Himir. In their huge bedroom that night, tears at Thor. I hope you know what you're doing. Of course I do, said Thor. But he didn't. He was just doing whatever he felt like doing. <laughs> That's what Thor did best. In the gray light before dawn, Thor met Himir on the dock. I should warn you, little Bjorn, said the giant, that we will be going far out into the icy waters. I row farther out into the cold and stay out longer than a tiny thing like you can survive. Icicles will form on your beard and hair, and you will turn blue with cold. 
probably you will die. Ah, oh, doesn't worry me, said Thor. I like the cold. It's bracing. What are we using for bait? Ah, oh, I already have my own bait, said Hymir. You must find your own. You could look out in the field of auction for it. Nice big maggots in the ox dung, after all. Bring whatever you want from there. Thor looked at Hymir. He thought about hitting Hymir with his hammer. Then he would never get the cauldron. Not without a fight. He walked back up the shore. In the meadow was Hymir's herd of beautiful oxen. There were giant patties of dung on the ground. With huge maggots. Writhing and burrowing in them. But Thor avoided all of them. Instead, he walked over to the biggest, most majestic, fattest of the beasts, raised his fist, and thumped it between the eyes, killing it instantly. Thor ripped off the beast's head, placed it into a sack, and carried it down to the sea. Mir was in the boat. He already cast off and was rowing out to the bay. Thor jumped into the cold water and swam out, hauling his sack behind him. He grabbed the back of the boat with numb fingers and hauled himself on board, dripping with seawater, ice crusting his red beard. Ah, said Thor. That was fun. Nothing to wake you up on a cold morning like a good swim. Emir said nothing. Thor took the other set of oars and they began to row together. Soon enough the land was gone. And they were alone on the waters of the northern sea. The ocean was grey, the waves were choppy and high. And the wind and seagulls screamed. Mir stopped rowing. We will fish here, he said. Here, said Thor. We've hardly gone out into the sea at all. He picked up the oars and began single-handedly to row them into deeper waters. The boat flew across the waves. Stop! Boomed him in. Those waters are dangerous. This is where Jormungandr, the Midgard serpent, is to be found. Thor stopped rowing. Mir took two large fish from the bottom of the boat. He gutted them with his sharp, sharp bait knife, tossed the guts into the sea, and impaled the fish on the hooks of his line. He dropped his baited fishing line and waited until the line jerked and twitched in his hand. Then he hauled up the line. Two monstrous whales hung from it, the hugest whales the Thor had ever seen. Ymir grinned with pride. Not bad, said Thor. He pulled the head of the ox from his sack. When Hymir saw the dead eyes of his favorite ox, his face froze. I got bait, said Thor helpfully, from the ox field, like you said. Expressions of shock, of horror, and of anger chased each other on Hymir's huge face, but he said nothing. Thor took Hymir's fishing line rammed the ox's head onto the hook and threw the line into the and the head into the ocean. He felt it sink to the bottom. Fishing, he said to Hymir. I suppose it must be all about learning patience. It's a bit dull, isn't it? I wonder what I'm going to catch for our dinner. And that's when the sea erupted. Jormungandr. The Midgard serpent had bitten down on the huge ox head, and the hook had dug itself deep into the roof of his mouth. The serpent writhed in the water, trying to free itself. Thor held on to the line. It's gonna drag us under! Boomed to Mir in horror. Let go of the line! Thor shook his head. He strained against the fishing line, determined to hold on. The thunder god slammed his feet through the bottom of the boat, 
and he used the sea bottom to brace himself as he began to haul Jor Jormungandr up on board. The serpent spat gouts of black poison at them. Thor ducked, and the poison missed him. He continued to pull. It's the Midgard serpent, you fool! shouted Hammer. Like a rhino, we'll die! Thor said nothing. Just hauled the line in, hand over hand, his eyes fixed on his enemy. I will kill you, he whispered to the serpent, beneath the roar of the waves and the howl of the wind and the thrashing and screaming of the beast. Or he will kill me. This I swear. He said it beneath his breath, but he could have sworn that the Midgard serpent heard him fixed him with his eyes. The next scout of poison came so close to Thor that he could taste it in the ocean air. The poison sprayed his shoulder and it burned where it touched. Thor simply laughed and hauled again. Somewhere it seemed to Thor in the distance. Ymir was babbling and grumbling and shouting about the monster serpent. About the sea rushing into the rowing boat through the holes in the bottom and how they would both die out here in the cold, cold ocean so far from dry land. Thor did not care about any of this. He was fighting the serpent, playing it, letting it exhaust itself, thrashing and pulling. Thor began to pull the fishing line back onto the boat. The Midgard serpent's head was almost at striking distance. Thor reached down without glancing away. His fingers closed round the shaft of his hammer. He knew just where the head of the hammer would need to strike to kill the serpent. One more heave at the fishing line end. Himir's bait knife flashed, and the line was cut. Jormungandr, the spirit. Sorry, Jormungandr, the serpent, reared up high above the boat and then tumbled back into the sea. Thor threw his hammer at it, but the monster was already gone. It vanished into the cold gray waters. The hammer returned and Thor caught it. He turned his attention back to the sinking fishing boat. Ymir was desperately bailing the water from the bottom. Himir bailed the water and Thor rowed the boat back to shore. The two whales that Himir had caught earlier, the prow of the boat, made rowing harder than it normally would have been. There's the shore, gasped Himir. <laughs> Yo, sassy. My home is still many miles distant. We could land here, said Thor. Only if you are willing to carry the boat and me, and the two whales I caught all the way to my hall, said Himir, exhausted. Mm. All right. Thor jumped over the side of the fishing boat. A few moments later, Himir felt the boat rising into the air. Thor was carrying them all on his back. The boat, oars, Himir and the whales, carrying them along the sh shingle at the edge of the sea. When they reached Himir's hall, Thor lowered the boat to the ground. There. Oh, whoops. There, said Thor. I brought you home, as you requested. Now I need a favor from you in return. What is it? said Himir. Your cauldron. The huge one you brew beer in. I want to borrow it. Himir said, You are a mighty fisherman, and you row hard. But you are asking for the finest brewing kettle in existence. The beer that is magically brewed in it is the best of beers. I'll only lend it to somebody who can break the cup I drink from. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't sound very hard, said Thor. 
They ate roast whale meat for dinner that night. The hall filled with many-headed giants, all of them shouting and happy, and most of them drunk. After they'd eaten, Muir drains the last of the beer from his drinking cup and called for silence. Then he handed the cup to Thor. Smash it, said he. Smash the cup from the cauldron in which I brew my beer as yours as a gift to you. Fail, and you will die. Thor nodded. The giants stopped their joking and their songs. They watched him warily. Ymir's fortress was built of stone. Thor took the drinking cup, hefted it in the air with both hands, and threw it with all his might against one of the granite pillars that held up the roof of the banqueting hall. It was an ear-splitting crash, and the air was filled with blinding dust. When the dust settled, Ymir got up, walked over to what was left of the granite pillar, the cup had gone through, first one pillar, then another, breaking them into tiny fragments of stone. The rubble of the third pillar was the drinking cup, a little dusty, but quite undamaged. The man held his drinking cup above his head. The giants cheered and laughed and made faces at Thor, with all their heads, along with crude gestures. Ymir sat down at the table once more. See, he said to Thor. I didn't think you were strong enough to break my cup. He held the cup and his wife poured beer in, into it. Ymir slurped the beer. Best beer you'll ever taste, he said. Here, wife, pour more beer for your son and for his friend of yours. Let them taste the best beer. There is. And be sad that they will not take my cauldron home with them. That they will never know again. Taste beer this good. Also, they will be sad that I need to kill Vio now. For my cup remains unbroken. Thor sat at the table beside Tyr. And picked up a lump of charred whale meat and chewed it resentfully. The giants were raucous and loud, and now they were ignoring him. Tyr's mother leaned over to fill Thor's cup with beer. You know, she said quietly, my husband is very hard-headed. He's stubborn and thick-skulled. They say the same with me, said Thor. No, she said, as if she were talking to a small child. He has a very hard head. Hard enough to break even the toughest of cups. Thor drained his beer. It was really the best beer he'd ever tasted. He stood up and walked over to Hamid. May I try again? He asked. The giants in the hall laughed at this. And none of them laughed louder than Hamid. Of course you can. Thor picked up the drinking cup. He faced the stone wall. Stone wall and hefted the cup once, twice, and then turned swiftly on his heel and smashed the cup down on Hymir's forehead. The fragments of the cup fell one by one onto Hymir's lap. There was silence in the hall, and the silence broken by a strange heaving noise. Thor looked up and around to see what the noise was. And he turned back and saw Hymir's shoulders shaking. The giant was crying in huge, heaving sobs. My greatest treasures no longer mine, said Hymir. I could always tell it to brew me ale. And the cauldron itself would magically brew the finest beer. Never again will I say. My cauldron. Thor said nothing. Ymir looked at Tyr and said bitterly, If you want it, step shun, then take it. It's huge and heavy. It takes over a dozen giants to lift it. 
Do you think you're strong enough? Tyr walked over to the cauldron. He tried to lift it once, twice, but it was too heavy for even him. He looked at Thor. Thor shrugged, grasped the cauldron by the rim, and flipped it so that he was inside it. And the handles clattered at his feet. Then the cauldron began to move with Thor inside. It headed toward the door, while all around the hall, many giant headed demons stared open mouthed. Mir no longer wept. Tyr glanced up at him. Thank you for the cauldron, he said, and then, keeping the moving cauldron between himself and the mirror, Tyr edged out of the room. Thor and Tyr left the castle together, untethered by Thor's goat. Oh, untethered Thor's goats, and climbed into Thor's chariot. Thor still carried the cauldron on his back. The goats ran as best they could, but while Snarler ran well and ran fast. Even with the weight of the giant's cauldron to pull, the grinder limped and staggered. Its leg had once been broken from arrow, and Thor had set it, but the goat had never been as strong again. The grinder bleated in pain as it ran. Grinder, sorry. Can't we go any faster? asked Tyr. Well, we can try, said Thor and he whipped the goats so that they ran faster. Tyr looked behind. They're coming, he said. The giants are coming. They were indeed coming, and with Himir at the rear, urging them on, all the giants of that part of the world and many-headed monsters bunch, the giants of the waste, misshapen and deadly, an army of giants all intent on getting their cauldron back. Go faster, said Tyr. It was then that the goat called Grinder stumbled and fell, throwing him out of the chariot. Thor staggered to his feet, then threw the cauldron to the ground and began to laugh. What are you laughing about? said Tyr. There are hundreds of them. Thor hefted Mjolnir, his hammer. I didn't catch and kill the serpent, he said. Not this time. But a hundred giants almost make up for it. Methodically, enthusiastically, one after the next, Thor killed the giants of the waste until the earth ran black and red with their blood. Two fought, fought one-handed. He fought bravely. He slew his share of giants that day. And they were done, and all the giants were dead. Thor crouched beside Grinder, his injured goat, and helped it back to its feet. The goat limped as it walked, and Thor cursed Loki, whose fault it was that the goat was lame. The mare was not among the ones slain, and Tyr was relieved. He did not want to bring his mother any additional distress. And Thor carried the cauldron to Asgard to the meeting of the gods. And they took the cauldron to Aegir. Here, said Thor, a brewing cauldron big enough for all of us. The sea giant sighed. It is indeed what I asked for. He said, Very well. There will be an autumn feast for all the gods in my hall. He is as good as his word. And since then, every year once the harvest is in, the gods drink the finest ale there ever was or will be in the autumn. In the sea giant's hall. How's that for a a sea monster.
He liked it, smiles. got scared of the what are you laughing about line because I was laughing at that moment. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It was good uh, timing on that one. Deep love of Norse mythology, so that was a treat. Same. I love Norse mythology. Tenchi does too. Very, very big fan of Norse mythology. I might do like. I'm tempted to do a stream where I just read to you guys the poetic Edda. Or maybe like bits of the prose Edda. All right, what next? Another story here if we want to do pages. This is well, sassy. Thunder Kitty, y'all have any requests before I move on? Oh. Somebody needs to be banned. There we go. I have a hard time reading the edits, so that might be nice someday. Yeah. I enjoy the edits. Polish buff. Um. Yeah, I have them here actually. I have both the Poetic Eta and the Prose Eta. What are Eta's? Eta's are. Oh god, how do I explain this? The Eddas are basically the canon of Norse mythology. Um, it's the, the story of the gods and the kings from basically the rise of the gods to the end in it is detailed Ragnarok um, Ragnarok the details of Yggdrasil which is the life tree how Odin lost his eye um It is from these that we know of Odin's ravens, Hugin and Nu. Um, I believe it also mentions how Odin discovered the, the Norse runes um, and how he lost his eye in the well of Mimir. Beautiful stories. The Havamal is fun. Mm. 
the poetic Gita is, is kind of poetic. Whereas the prose Gita, which was written later, um, is more descriptive in nature and has more content, I guess you could say. You have a pocket, have them all? Awesome. Yeah, I have a few translations of both the prose and poetic Gita here. Yeah, I have at least two poetic Gita. Yeah, and I think only one of the, the pros that are. Although I find that hard to believe. But yeah, if you guys want me to read something else, just, just shout. I've got everything here. You down for anything? Wow, there are not actually a ton of um, translations of the prose you do. The ones that exist are fucking ancient. Yeah, they're very old. I could have sworn that Jackson Crawford. Edda. No, he did the poetic Edda. He has a YouTube channel, yeah. They're pretty good. Well, the poetic Edda is, is much more popular for for reasons that are not terribly difficult to understand. All right. I'm gonna take another book out. I'm gonna do another sea story.
This one is called the Cormorants of Andvair by Jonas Lai. Outside Andvair lies an island. The haunt of wild birds which no man can land upon for the sea is never so quiet the sea swell girds it round about with sucking whirlpools and dashing breakers on fine summer days something sparkles there through the sea foam like a large gold ring and time out of mind Folks of fancy, they were treasure there left by some pirates of old. At sunset, sometimes, there looms forth from thence a vessel, a castle astern. And a glimpse is caught now and then of an old fashioned galley. There it lies as if in tempest and carves its way along the heavy white rollers. Along the rocks sit the cormorants in a large black row, lying in wait for dogfish. But there was a time. There was a time. God fucking damn it. Hold on. But there was a time when no one knew the exact numbers of these birds. There was never more nor less of them than twelve. Sorry. There was a time when one knew. There were never more nor less than twelve. Well, upon a stone. Out in the sea mist sat the 13th. It was only visible when it rose and flew right over the island. The only persons who lived near the Ver at winter time, long after the sea fishing season was over, was a woman and a slip of a girl. Their business was to guard the scaffolding poles for drying fish against the birds of prey, who had such a villainous trick of hacking at the drying ropes. The young girl had a thick, coal black hair, and a pair of eyes that peeped at folk so oddly. One might almost have said that she was like the cormorants outside there, and she never seen much else all her life. Nobody knew who her father was. Thus they lived till the girl had grown up. It was found that in the summertime when the fishermen went out to the Ver to fetch away the dried fish, the young fellows began underbidding each other so as to be selected for that special errand. Some gave up their share of profits and others their wages. There was general complaint in all the villages round that on such occasions no end of betrothals were broken off. But the cause of it all was the girl out yonder with the odd eyes. For all her rough and ready ways, she had something about her, said those she chatted with. But there was no resistance. She turned the heads of all the young fellows. It seemed that they could not live without her. The first winter, a lad wooed her, who had both house and warehouse of his own. If you come again in the summertime, and give me the right gold wing I'll be wedded by, something may come of it, said she. And sure enough, in the summertime, the lad was there again. He had a lot of fish to fetch away, and she might have had a gold ring as heavy and as bonny as a heart could wish for. 
The ring I must have lies beneath the wreckage. In the iron chest, over at the island yonder, said she. That is, if you love me enough to dare fetch it. But then the lad grew pale. He saw the sea boar rise and fall out there, like a white wall of foam on the bright, warm summer day. And on the island sat the comrades, sleeping in the sunshine. Dearly do I love thee, said he, but such a quest as that would mean my burial, not my bridal. The same instant the thirteenth cormorant rose from his stone in the misty foam and flew right over the island. Next winter, the steersman of a yacht came wooing. For two years, he had gone about and hugged his misery for her sake. And got the same answer. God, my lamp keeps dying. There we go. If you could come again in the summertime and give me the right gold ring I'll be wedded with. Something may come of it. Out to the fair he came again on Midsummer's Day. When he heard where the gold ring lay, he sat and wept the whole day till evening. And the sun began to dance northwestward into the sea. Then the thirteenth cormorant rose and he flew right over the island. There was nasty weather during the third winter. There were manifold wrecks. And on the keel of a boat, which came in driving ashore, hung an exhausted young lad by his knife belt. But they couldn't get the life back in him, roll and rub him about in the boathouse as they might. Then the girl came in. "'Tis my bridegroom," said she. And she laid him in her bosom, and sat with him the whole night through, and put warmth into his heart. And when the morning came, his heart beat. He thought I lay betwixt the wings of a cormorant, and leaned my head against its downy breast, said he. The lad was ruddy and handsome, with curly hair, and he couldn't take his eyes away from the girl. And he took work upon the bear, but off he he must needs be gotten and chatting with her. He never so early and never so late. So it fared with him, as it had fared with the others. It seemed to him that he could not live without her. And on the day when he was bound to depart, he wooed her. Thee, I will not fool, said she. Thou hast lain on my breast, and I would give my life to save thee from sorrow. Thou shalt have me if thou wilt place the betrothal wing upon my finger. But longer than the day lasts, thou canst not keep me. And now I will wait. And long after thee with a horrible longing. Till summer comes. On midsummer day, the youth came to there in his boat, all alone. Then she told him of the ring that he must fetch for her from among the scaries. If thou hast taken me off the keel of a boat, thou mayest cast me forth yonder again, said the lad. Live without thee, I cannot. As he laid hold of the oars, in order to row out, she stepped into the boat with him, and sat in the stern. Wondrous fair she was. It was beautiful summer weather, and as a swell upon the sea, wave followed upon wave. And long bright rollers. The lad sat there, lost in the sight of her. And he rode and rode till the insucking breakers roared and thundered among the scaries. The ground swell was strong, and the frothing foam spurted up as high as the towers. If thy life is dear to me, turn back now, 
said she. Thou art dearer to me than life itself, he made answer. But just as it seemed to the lad that the pro were going to go under, and the jaws of death were gaping wide before him, it grew at once as still as calm, and the boat could run ashore as if there was never a billow there. On the island lay a rusty old ship's anchor half out of the sea. In the iron chest which lies beneath the anchor is my dowry, said she. Carry it up to thy boat, and put the ring that thou seest on my finger. With this thou dost make me thy bride. So now I am thine, till the sun dances northwestward into the sea. It was a gold ring with a red stone in it. And he put it on her finger and kissed her. In a cleft on the scary was a patch of green grass. There they sat them down, and they were ministered to in wondrous wise. How he knew not, nor cared to know, so great was his joy. Midsummer days, beauteous, said she, and I am young, and thou art my bridegroom. Oh. No, we're good. We're good. Okay. God, I was just like, I'm not about to read porn again, am I? Okay. And now we'll to our bridal bed. So bonny was she that he could not contain himself with love. But when night drew nigh and the sun began to dance out into the sea, she kissed him and shed tears. Beauteous is the summer day, said she. And still more beauteous is the summer evening. But now the dusk cometh. And all at once... It seemed to him that she were coming older and older, and fading right away. When the sun went below the sea margin, there lay before him on the scary, some moldering linen rags and nothing else. Calm was the sea, and in the clear midsummer night there flew twelve cormorants out over the sea. It's 1024, but I have a couple left in me. Where do y'all want to go? I could do Ireland.
All right. Let's take a look at the demon cat. The Demon Cat by Lady Wild. There was once a woman in Connemara, the wife of a fisherman. As he'd always. Good luck. She had plenty of fish, at all times stored away in the house ready for market. But to her great annoyance, she found that a great cat used to come in at night and devour all the best and finest fish. So she kept a big stick by her and determined to watch. One day she and a woman were spinning together. The house suddenly became quite dark, and the door was bust open as if by a blast of the tempest. When in walked a huge black cat, who went straight up to the fire, and turned round and growled at them. Why, surely this is the devil, said a young girl, who was by sorting fish. Don't teach me how to call you names. Don't teach you how to call me names, said the cat. And jumping at her, he scratched her arm till blood came. Oh, there no, he said. You'll be more civil another time when a gentleman comes to see you. And with that, he walked over to the door and shut it close. To prevent any of them going out. But the poor young girl walked crying loudly from fright and pain made a desperate rush to get away. Just then a man was going by hearing the cries and pushed open the door and tried to get in but the cat stood on the threshold and would let no one pass. On this the man attacked him with a stick and gave him a sound blow. The cat however was more than a match in the fight for it flew at him and tore his face and his hands so badly that the man at last took to his heels and ran away as fast as he could. Ah, now's my time for dinner, said the cat, going up to examine the fish that was laid out on the tables. I hope the fish is good today. Ah, don't disturb me, nor make a fuss. I can help myself. With that, he jumped up and began to devour all the best fish, while he growled at the women. Away out of this, you wicked beast! She cried, giving it a blow with the tongs that would have broken its back. Only it was a devil. Out of this, no fish he'll have today! But the cat only grinned at her and went on tearing and spoiling and devouring the fish. Evidently, not a bit worse for the blow. On this, both the women attacked it with sticks and struck hard blows enough to kill it. On which the cat glared at them and spit fire, making a leap, tore their heads and arms till blood came, and the frightened women rushed shrieking from the house. But presently the mistress returned, carrying with her a bottle of holy water, and looked in, she saw the cat was still devouring the fish and not minded. So she crept over and quietly threw holy water on it without a word. No sooner was this done, than dense black smoke filled the place, through which nothing was seen but two red eyes of the cat, burning like coals of fire. Then the smoke gradually cleared away, and she saw the body of the creature burning slowly till the can until it became shriveled and black like cinder and finally disappeared. And from that time, the fish remained untouched and safe from her. For the power of evil was broken, and the demon cat was seen no more.
I'll give you another. Let's do... Do the headless horseman. Godspeed you, and a safe journey this night to you, Charlie. Ejaculated the master of the little Shivan house at Balahuli after his old friend and good customer, Charlie Colmaine. At length, it turned his face homeward. But the prospect of this dreary ride as dark a night as ever fell upon the black water along the banks of which he was about to journey. Charlie Colnay knew the country well, and moreover, he was a bold rider as any mallow boy that ever rattled a four-year-old Ponderman race course. He'd gone to Fermoy- oh wait, hold up, this is completely wrong. This is American. Oops. Send it with a ghost story. Here we go. Never mind, hold on.
captive god is... Oh wait, this is... This isn't the thing. Hold on. I'm sorry. This will probably be my last one. I'm fading. Not good, you're barely. Yeah, it's okay. That music making me real sleepy. It's really relaxing. Alright, hold on. Go for myths and folklore island. Alright. We ended with a nightingale last week, so we'll end with a nightingale on this week as well. This is Oscar Wilde's The Nightingale and the Rose. She said that she'd dance with me if I brought her red roses, cried the young student. But in all my garden, there's no red rose. From her nest in the holm oak tree, the nightingale heard him. And she looked out through the leaves and wondered. No red rose in all my garden, he cried. His beautiful eyes filled with tears. Ah, on what little things does happiness depend? I have read all that the wise men have written, and all the secrets of philosophy are mine. Yet, for want of a red rose, my life is made wretched. Here at last is a true lover, said the nightingale. Night after night, I've, have I sung of him? Though well, I knew him not. Night after night I told his story to the stars, and now I see him. His hair is dark as the hyacinth blossom, and his lips are red, and the rose of his desire but passion has made his face like pale ivory, and sorrow has set her seal upon his brow. The prince gives a ball tomorrow night, muttered the young student. My love will be of the company. If I bring her red rose, she'll dance with me till dawn. If I bring her red rose, I shall hold her in my arms, and she'll lean her head upon my shoulder. And her hand will be clasped in mine. But there's no red rose in my garden, so she'll sit lonely. And she'll pass me by. 
Do I have no heat in me? My heart will break. Okay, homeboy. If her courting you depends on you having a red rose, you might want to rethink your, your choices and mates here. Here indeed, it's the true lover, said the nightingale. What I sing of, he suffers. What is joy to me, to him is pain. Surely love is a wonderful thing, it is more precious than emerald, and dearer than fine opals. Pearls and pomegranates cannot buy it, nor is it set forth in the marketplace. It may not be purchased of the merchants, nor can it be weighed out in the balance of gold. Ah, the musicians will sit in their gallery, said the young student, and play on their stringed instruments. My love will dance to the sound of the harp and the violin. She'll dance so lightly that her feet will not touch the floor, and the courtiers in their gay dresses will throng around her. But with me she'll not dance, for I have no red rose to give her. And he flung himself down on the grass and buried his face in his hands and wept. Why is he weeping? Asked a little green lizard as he ran past him with his tail in the air. Oh, why indeed? Said a butterfly who was fluttering around after a sunbeam. Oh, why indeed? Said a daisy to his neighbor in a slow, low voice. Oh, he is weeping for a red rose. Said the nightingale. Not for a red rose? He cried. Oh, very ridiculous. And the little lizard, who was something of a cynic, <laughs> laughed outright. But the nightingale understood the secret of the student's sorrow, and she sat silent in the oak tree, and thought about the mystery of love. Suddenly she spread her brown wings for flight, and soared into the air. She passed through the grove, like a shadow. Like a shadow she sailed across the garden. In the centre of the grass plot was standing a beautiful rose tree, and when she saw it, she flew over to it and lit upon the spray. Give me a red rose, she cried, and I'll sing you my sweetest song. But the tree shook its head. My roses are white, it answered, as white as the foam of the sea, and whiter than the snow upon the mountain. But go to my brother who grows around the road, the old sundial, and perhaps he will give you what you want. So the nightingale flew over to the rose tree that was growing around the old sundial. Give me a red rose, she cried, and I'll sing you my sweetest song. But the tree shook his head. My roses are yellow, it answered, as yellow as the hair of the mermaiden who sits upon an amber throne and yellower than the daffodil that blooms in the meadow before the mower. Comes with his scythe. But go to my brother, who grows beneath the student's window, and perhaps he will give you what you want. So the nightingale flew over to the rose tree that was growing beneath the student's window. Give me a red rose, she cried, and I will sing you my sweetest song. But the tree shook his head. My roses are red, it answered, as red as the feet of a dove, and redder than the great fans of coral that wave and wave in the ocean cavern. But winter has chilled my veins, and the frost has nipped my buds, and the storm has broken my branches, and I shall have no roses at all this year. Oh, we had your debating advice a little bit. One red rose is all I want, cried the nightingale. Only one red rose? Is there no way I can get it? There is a way, answered the tree, but it is so terrible that I dare not tell it to you. Tell it to me, said the nightingale. I am not afraid. If you want a red rose, said the tree, you must build it out of music by moonlight and stain it with your own heart's blood. You must sing to me with your breast against a thorn. All night long you must sing to me. 
and the thorn must pierce your heart, and your lifeblood must flow into my veins and become mine. Oh, death is a great price to pay for a red rose, cried the nightingale, and life is very dear to all. It's pleasant to sit in the green wood and watch the sun in his chariot of gold, and the moon in her chariot of pearl. Sweet is the scent of the hawthorn, and sweet are the blue bells that hide in the valley, and health is, and the heather that blows on the hill. Yet love is better than life, and what is the heart of a bird compared to the heart of a man? Hey, don't sell yourself short. So she spread her brown wings for flight and soared into the air. She swept over the garden like a shadow. Like a shadow, she sailed to the grove. The young student was still lying on the grass where she'd left him, and the tears were not yet dry in his beautiful eyes. Ah, be happy, cried the nightingale. Be happy, you shall have your red rose. I have built it out of my music by moonlight, and stained it with my own heart's blood. All I ask of you is you return. That you'll be a true lover. For love is wiser than philosophy, though she's wise. And lighter than power, though he's mighty. Flame colored are his wings, and colored like flame in his body. His leaps are sweet as honey, and his breath like frankincense. The student looked up from the grass and listened, but he could not understand what the nightingale was saying to him. For he knew only the things that were written down in books. But the oak tree understood and felt sad, for he was very fond of the little nightingale who had built her nest in his branches. Sing me one last song, he whispered. I shall feel very lonely when you're gone. So the nightingale sang to the oak tree, and her voice was like water, bubbling from a silver jar. When she'd finished her song, the student got up and pulled a notebook and a lead pencil out of his pocket. Ah, oh, she has form, he said to himself as he walked away through the grove. That can't be denied to her. How does she got feeling? I'm afraid not. In fact, she's like most artists. She's all style. Without any sincerity. She would not sacrifice her solid colors. She thinks merely of music. And everyone knows that the arts are selfish. Still, it must be admitted that she has some beautiful notes in her voice. What a pity it is that they do not mean anything or do any practical good. And he went to his room and lay down on his little pallet bed and began to think of his love. And after a time, he fell asleep. And when the moon rose and shone in the heavens, the nightingale flew to the rose tree. <coughs> and set her breast against the thorn. All night long she sang with her breast against the thorn. And the cold crystal moon leaned down and listened. And all night long she sang, and the thorn went deeper and deeper into her breast, and her lifeblood ebbed away from her. She sang first a birth of love in the heart of a boy and a girl, and on top of the spray of the rose tree there blossomed a marvelous rose. Petal following petal, I sung the Lord's song. Pale was it at first, as the mist that hangs over the river. Pale is the feet of the morning, and silver is the wings of the dawn. As the shadow of a rose in a mirror of silver, as the shadow of a rose in a water pool, so was the rose that blossomed on the topmost spray of the tree. But the tree cried to the nightingale to press closer against the thorn. Press closer, little nightingale, cried the tree, or day will come before the rose is finished. The nightingale pressed closer against the thorn, and louder and louder blew her song. For she sang of the birth of passion in the soul of a man and a maid. 
And the delicate flush of pink came to the leaves of the rose. Like the blush in the face of the bridegroom when he kisses the lips of the bride. The thorn had not yet reached her heart. And so the rose's heart remained white. For only nightingale's blood came crimson the heart of the rose. And the tree cried to the nightingale to press closer against the thorn. So the nightingale pressed closer against the thorn. And the thorn touched her heart. And a fierce pang of pain shot through her. Bitter, bitter was the pain. And a fierce pain. Oh. Bitter, bitter was the pain, and wilder and wilder grew her song. For she sang of the love that's perfected by death. Of the love that does not die in the tomb. And the marvelous rose became crimson. Like the rose of the eastern sky. Crimson was the girdle of petals, and crimson was as a ruby was the heart. For the nightingale's voice grew fainter, and her little wings began to beat, and a film came over her eyes. Fainter and fainter grew her song, and she felt something choking her in the throat. And she gave one last burst to music. The white moon heard it, and she forgot the dawn. And lingered on in the sky. The red rose heard it and it trembled all over with ecstasy and opened its petals in the cold morning air. Echo bore it to the purple cavern in the hills and woke the sleeping shepherds from their dreams. It floated through the breeze of the river and it carried its message to the sea. Look, look! cried the tree. The rose is finished now. But the nightingale made no answer. No answer. For she was lying dead in the grass, with a thorn in her heart. And at noon the student opened his window and looked out. Why, what a wonderful piece of luck, he cried. Here's a red rose. I've never seen any rose like it in all my life. It's beautiful, and that I'm sure it has a long Latin name. And he leaned down and plucked it. And then he put on his hat and ran up to the professor's house with the rose in hand. The daughter of the professor was sitting in the doorway, winding blue silk on a reel. And her little dog was lying at her feet. You said that you'd dance with me if I brought you a red rose, cried the student. Here's the reddest rose in all and here's the reddest rose in all the world. I'll wear it tonight next to your heart. And as we dance together, I'll tell you how I love you. But the girl frowned. I'm afraid it will not go with my dress, she answered. And besides, the Chamberlain's nephew has sent some real jewels to me, and everyone knows that jewels cost far more than flowers. Well, oh, upon my word, you're very ungrateful, said the student angrily. He threw the rose into the street. It fell into the gutter. And a cartwheel went over it. I'm grateful, said the girl. I'll tell you what you are. You're very rude. And after all, who are you? You're me, student. Why, I don't believe you've even got silver buckles on your shoes as the Chamberlain's nephew has. And she got up from her chair and went into the house. Oh, what a silly thing love is, said the student as he walked away not half as useful as logic. It does not prove anything. It is always telling one of the things that are not going to happen. And making one believe things that are not true. In fact, it's quite unpractical. And as is the age to be practical is everything. I shall go back to philosophy and study metaphysics. Metaphysics? Oh god. So he returned to his room and pulled out a great dusty book and began to read. What the fuck? I mean, I can't say I'm surprised.
Can we throw him in a gutter? Honestly, though. I think that's where I'll call it. Just throw the whole man out, really, though. Like, that little bird worked so hard. I think this was a decent stream. I mean, apparently his breath smells like frankincense. It's a bit strange that his breath smells like frankincense, I will say that. I don't know how one gets their breath to be that way. with a little bit of poetry. <sighs> I'll be eating incense sticks. Sorry, you missed the start. No problem. Here, let's do the other one. Loud, there is a singer, everyone has heard. Loud midsummer and midwood bird. He makes the solid tree trunk sound again. He says the leaves are old, and that for flowers, midsummer is to spring as one to ten. He says the early petal fall is past, when pear and cherry bloom went down in showers. On sunny days, a moment overcast, and comes that other fall, you name the fall. He says the highway dust is over all. The bird was to cease, and be as other birds, but that he knows in singing not to sing. The question that he frames in all but words is what to make of a diminished thing. Robert Frost knew what he was doing. That and Hyla Creek. Actually, let's finish with acquainted with the night. <laughs> I have been one acquainted with the night. I've walked out in rain and back in rain. I have outwalked the furthest city light. I have looked down the saddest city lane. I have passed by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes and willing to explain. I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet. And far away, an interrupted cry came over houses from another street. But not to call me back or say goodbye. And further still, at an unearthly height, a luminary clock against the sky proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. I have been unacquainted with the night. Do not eat or drink any questionable substances. Make smart decisions. Do not die. Dying is absolutely forbidden. And I will see all of you wonderful people at a later time. Perhaps tomorrow morning. Uh, sorry. Perhaps tomorrow night. Perhaps later. 
Pode ser. And perhaps I'll be better rested by then. I hope you guys enjoyed yourselves tonight. Take care, guys.